So now I'm going to prepare the well. Uh, I've already uh, microwaved the agarose, so it's melted. Take the cover off there. Uh, I'm going to pour it into one of these two trays, and I'm going to use the comb with the six sides pointed down. I'm going to let that set for about 10 minutes and let it cool and solidify. Okay, so it's been about 10 minutes since I poured the gel cup into here. And you can kind of check. I'm just going to gently touch the corner of it. It feels like it's solidified. Now I'm going to remove the comb carefully. I don't damage the wells. Then I'm going to remove the gel from here. And looks good. I'm going to kind of wipe off the bottom of it in case it has any extra uh, agarose on the bottom there. And then that's going to go in here. The, if you can see this or not, it's got like an insert that shows from the negative side that the wells are gonna go there. And if I put it in there correctly, it shouldn't be forced, it'll just set in there. So there's the gel. The DNA is gonna run from the negative side to the positive side because DNA has a slight negative charge to it. This is gonna line up in here. All right, I'm gonna add my running buffer, TBE buffer. I'm going to pour it from one side to the other. Okay. I'm going to now pipette the DNA samples into the wells using a clean pipette tip every time setting it to 10.0 and I'll run a DNA marker first. So this is going to have base pairs of 100, 200, 300, 400, and so on up to 1,000. So I'll put the marker here. In the first well, and then I'm going to run N for Nathaniel. So you can see there's just a very small amount of DNA in there, and I just carefully extract 10 microliters. There's 10 microliters in the tip of that pipette. Okay, and then I'll uh, pipette 10 microliters of genes, PCR amplified DNA for the HTT gene, and the third one. And I believe it's... Uh, Run Peters in the fourth one. And Kim's in the last one. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to put the cover on, turn off the light, turn the power on, and now that's going to run again for uh, probably about 20, 
to 25 minutes and uh, we'll take a look at where the DNA is uh, settled to after that. Okay, so the gel has been running for about 45 minutes or so. And I just took a look and it looks pretty good. So to visualize this, um, I'll go ahead and show this here. I'm gonna turn the light on. And then, as you can see, Here's the gel, let me focus. So on the right, I mean on the left, there's the DNA marker, and then Nathaniel, Gene, Peter, and Kim, their DNA samples were all run. So I'm gonna take a picture of this, and I'm, we're gonna add it to the write-up, and we're gonna analyze the distance that those bands have traveled. And that'll help us determine the size of the fragments. So now that we've run the gel, I'm going to uh, include a screenshot onto my write-up. And you can, again, in the video, you can rewind back to a, a point where we had a pretty good screenshot in the video of this. So this would be a good place to screenshot. And that's what I'm going to add to Notability. So I'd prefer you to um, edit your own picture or screenshot rather than just screenshotting me, uh, my finished product here. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and follow the instructions here. Label the 100, 500, and 1,000 bands on the DNA marker. This was the marker right here. This was Nathaniel, Gene, Peter, and Kim for their samples. The marker is a uh, ladder where this is 100 base pairs, 200, 300, 400, and so on, up to the last one is 1,000, okay? And notice that the DNA gaps uh, between these are not uniform, that the smaller regions actually run a lot farther than, so the gap between 100 and 200 is a lot greater than 200 and 300 is a lot greater than 300 and 400 and so on. Just wanna point that out. So when you're doing, when you're using the marker as a reference point, you have to kind of understand that. Okay, so Nathaniel, let's analyze his bands here. This first one, um, you know, where is that? Well, it's between the 100 and the 200. And I'm not going to be this specific with all of them, but that actually is exactly what we just analyzed uh, right up here. His, um, that is actually exactly this, okay? So that would have been like a 171, um, base, base pair of fragment. So, you know, if I didn't know that, I would guess like, oh, that looks like it's about 170 or that looks like it's about 180 or something like that. So I'll just tell you that that's exactly 171. But for the rest of them, I'll estimate along with you. So Nathaniel, in the chart here, total number of base pairs in the PCR amplified product, 171 for one of his bands. What was the other one? Well, where's that? That's a little more than 300, right? It's about there. So maybe we'll call that like, let's just round it, we'll call that like 320 or something like that. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can fill out the rest of these. Like for instance, Jean, she's got um, these two fragments. Okay, so where would those be, right? Um, looks like maybe about, gosh, what would that be? Like one, Mm, 140 and maybe uh, 160 maybe would be her fragments there. Okay, so go ahead and do that for the rest of them. So. Um, Peter would have like, that one looks almost like identical to Nathaniel's. So I'll call that 170. That one's about 430. Okay, and then Kim. This is confusing. You're like, wait a minute, where's Kim's band? She only has one. Well, actually, that's notice that that's actually a pretty bright region. Oh, that's because both bands are right there. So she actually has two 
right there in the same spot. So both of her bands are identical size. And that, again, that looks like that's about that 170 region. Okay, I'll just call that 172 just so that they're all about the same. So there you go. That's kind of my estimation of what the raw data would look like if I'm saying what is the total fragment size of Nathaniel, Gene, Peter, and Kim's DNA um, in that PCR amplified region. So I've done my best. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those raw numbers and I'm going to figure out, okay, how many base pairs, how many CAGs do I have? Remember that without any CAGs, the total fragment size is 114, I believe, from that's what we figured out from up here, 114. So if I take the raw numbers, 170, subtract 114, I will figure out how many CAGs I've got for each of these. So I'm going to go ahead and do that math. I'm going to pause the video since I don't have a calculator, so you don't have to watch me struggle with that. Okay, so I filled out the second and third column. Again, the second column I filled out, I um, took 170, for instance, minus 114, and that would give me that there's 56 C's, A's, and G's, or 320 minus 114 would be 209 C's, A's, and G's, because that's what I'm interested in, how many C's, A's, and G's there are. And more than that, I want to know how many repeats there are. So to do that, I divide the C, A, G's by 3, and I get that's how many repeats there are. So for instance, then I would have taken like 56 divided by 3 is 19. 209 divided by 3 is 70. 26 divided by 3 is 9, and so on. And so then I get these, uh, these are the, actually the genotypes then, right? This is like how many uh, CAG repeats there are. So for instance, Nathaniel's genotype for the HTT gene is 19 comma 70. I know you're used to genotypes being like, Big T, little T for tall plants or little T, little T and that kind of a thing. But we're actually looking at a specific number. And so remember, if the number is 36 or greater, that would result in Huntington's. And of course, Nathaniel, we, we mentioned that he does come down with Huntington's at the age of 33. So yes, that 70 right there. Yes, that is uh, greater than 36 or th greater than 35. And he got Huntington's at the age of 33. A 9 and a 15 are both less than 35, less than 35, right? So that's no, they're not. This individual, Jean, is the mother, and she's not going to have Huntington's. Peter, the son, um, inherited an expanded region of uh, the gene. So that 70 actually became a lot larger of a region. And if I read that right, I think so. Um, so Peter will come down with Huntington's probably in his 20s. And I don't know exactly what age, but because it's uh, a higher number of repeats, he might have juvenile or earlier onset of Huntington's. And then Kim actually um, lucked out, I guess. Kim received from the father the 19 and from the mother um, probably a 15, which became a 19 or something like that. So um, uh, Kim is not going to have Huntington's. It's just the luck of the draw, I guess you could say, that unfortunately Peter does, and um, that will be very difficult for the family. So that is how to read those. And then in order to do a Punnett square, you can just make the square, and then you take Nathaniel's genotype, which is 19 comma 70, and then you, for the CAG repeats, you take genes, which is 9, comma 15. And then this would be like 9, comma 19. This would be like 9, comma 20. Fifth, oh, and that's not 20, that's 70. Oops. I didn't write that very well. Fifteen, comma 19. 15, comma 70. So then you look at and say, okay, which genotypes are whose? And then Kim looks like she inherited the 15 comma 19, but it, um, it looks slightly different. It's 19 comma 19, but that looks like that's closest to that. Peter's is more like the bottom one there. There. So that's how you could do a Punnett square cross to figure that out. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. Um, 
go ahead and submit. Please don't, sometimes people submit a screenshot of my work. Please fill out the sheet on your own. And uh, hopefully that made sense. And you now know how to read a gel. And even though you didn't do a gel, if you're a distance learner, you're able to see what we did in class and get a little bit out of that activity. Now to clean up the lab, I'm just gonna uh, turn the power off, turn the light off. And then I'm just gonna Uh, rinse the buffer out, remove the gel, rinse the, uh, the gel tray out, and let that dry for the next group. This is, this is what the gel actually looks like. You can kind of see the DNA bands where they were on there.